because it's bureaucracy, they don't want the extra 500 guards and this kind of stuff. And more important, you don't trust the government. So I mean, you know, it is, it's not just the terrorists you don't trust, it's the government you don't yeah. trust. You see. Uh, well, I was thinking the issue of terrorism well. may be terribly important. It may end up with a semi-police state because of the terrorist problems. But it isn't the nuclear specific. This intellectual basically. laid the ground to avoid nuclear escalation between the U.S. and Russia. A nuclear conflict between Russia and the United States would have catastrophic consequences for both countries and the world as a whole. The use of nuclear weapons would result in the deaths of millions of people and could have long-lasting effects on the environment, including the potential for significant climate change. In addition to immediate human and environmental consequences, a nuclear conflict would also have significant economic and political implications. It could lead to the disruption of global trade and financial systems and could have a lasting impact on international relations and the global balance of power. Hello everyone, welcome back to Edge Capitalism, we analyze how power and value is created in the world. Today's video is about the role of two very big military superpowers, Russia and the United States, and how to avoid at all costs the escalation of the conflict between Ukraine and Russia. We will also be speaking about a not well-known intellectual on potential nuclear warfare, his name was Herman Khan. Do you want to know more? So let's get started. Until now, two main parts in the conflict can decrease or increase the war, Ukraine and Russia. And this is why nobody wants the United States to be part of the conflict. Ukraine has a medium-sized military with approximately 250,000 active personnel. It has a range of military equipment and weapons, including tanks, armored vehicles, artillery and aircraft. However, the military capabilities of Ukraine are generally considered to be weaker than those of Russia, and Ukraine has faced significant challenges in modernizing and upgrading its military in recent years. One of the main strengths of Ukraine's military is its personnel, who are generally considered to be well-trained and dedicated. Ukraine also has a well-developed military logistics system, which allows it to sustain military operations over long distances. However, Ukraine's military faces several challenges, including limited funding and a lack of modern weapons and equipment. In addition, the ongoing conflict with Russia has put significant strain on Ukraine's military and has led to significant losses in terms of personnel and equipment. Overall, while Ukraine has a large and capable military, it is generally considered to be at a large disadvantage in terms of military capabilities compared to Russia. If the conflict continues, it is therefore important for Ukraine to continue to work towards modernizing and upgrading its military, and to seek support and assistance from its allies and partners in order to enhance its military capabilities. In contrast, Russia is one of the world's largest and most powerful military powers. It has a large and well-trained military with a wide range of advanced weapons and equipment. Here are the main categories of military power for Russia. Personnel. Russia has a large military with around 1.3 active personnel. Land forces. Russia has a large and well-equipped land force with a variety of tanks, armored vehicles, and other ground-based weapon systems. Air force. Russia has a modern and powerful air force with a fleet of advanced fighter jets and other aircraft. Navy. Russia has a significant navy with a variety of surface ships, submarines, and other naval vessels. Strategic nuclear forces. Russia has a large and sophisticated strategic nuclear force, including intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs, and nuclear-powered submarines. Conventional weapons. Russia has a wide range of conventional weapons, including artillery, missiles, and other systems. Cyber capabilities. Russia has a well-developed cyber warfare capability and has been accused of carrying out cyber attacks against other countries. Special Forces Russia has a number of specialized military units, including the Spetsnaz Special Forces. Military Logistics Russia has a well-developed military logistics system with the ability to sustain military operations over long distances. Military Research and Development Russia has a strong military research and development sector and has made significant advancements in areas such as hypersonic weapons. There are several factors that contribute to the strength of Russia's large military which includes up to 1.3 million active personnel. One key factor is the size and quality of the military personnel. Russia has a large pool of able-bodied individuals to draw from for military service, and its military training is generally considered to be of high quality. This means that Russia has a large pool of well-trained and capable soldiers, sailors, and airmen to call upon in times of conflict. Another factor that contributes to the strength of Russia's military is its equipment and weapon systems. Russia has a wide range of advanced weapons and equipment, including tanks, aircraft, naval vessels, and missiles. 
This gives the Russian military a significant advantage in terms of firepower and technological capabilities. Also, Russia accounts with the larger stock of nuclear arms and a very wide number of intercontinental ballistic missiles. Intercontinental ballistic missiles ICBMs, are long-range missiles that are capable of carrying nuclear weapons over great distances, typically across continents. Therefore, Russia has a large and sophisticated strategic nuclear force. Some of the military advantages of Russian ICBMs are range. Russian ICBMs have a very long range, which allows them to reach targets located thousands of miles away. This gives Russia a significant strategic advantage as it can hold potential adversaries at risk from a distance. Payload Russian ICBMs can carry a variety of payloads including nuclear weapons. This gives Russia the ability to deliver a devastating blow to an enemy in the event of a conflict. Accuracy Russian ICBMs are designed to be highly accurate, with guidance systems that can help them hit their targets with precision. This means that Russia can strike specific military or civilian targets with a high degree of accuracy. Mobility Russian ICBMs are typically deployed on mobile launchers, which makes them difficult to track and target. This gives Russia the ability to move its ICBMs around, making them harder for an enemy to locate and attack. Deterrent The existence of a large and sophisticated strategic nuclear force, including ICBMs, can act as a deterrent to potential adversaries. The threat of a devastating nuclear attack can discourage other countries from engaging in aggressive actions against Russia. Overall, Russian ICBMs are a key component of the country's military power and provide a number of military advantages. However, in reality, the interests and strategies of countries in order to gain any advantage from a conflict can take into account scenarios of escalation, as specifically in avoiding the direct military and or nuclear intervention of NATO or a country like the United States. This was originally researched by the not well-known intellectual Hermann Kahn. In his view, there are many reasons why a nation might deliberately seek to escalate a crisis. Each of the criteria given measure the degree of escalation might also be a means or objective that one side or the other seeks. That is, one side might wish to escalate specifically to threaten the other side with all-out war, to provoke it, to demonstrate committal or recklessness, and so forth. A nation may also escalate for prudential as well as coercive reasons, to prevent something worse from happening to meet a problem, to prepare for likely escalations on the other side, and so on. A nation might evacuate its cities simply because it wished to protect its people, without necessarily thinking through or even facing the thought that by making its people less vulnerable, it increases its bargaining and military power. Perhaps to such an extent that the other side may feel under pressure either to take some direct action or to back down. Sometimes, the reasons for escalation whether prudential or pressure producing will affect the technique and consequences of the escalation, and other times they will not. According to Kahn, in his book on escalation, the conditions of two-sided escalation situations can be summarized as follows. Number 1. Either sides can usually put enough into the particular battle to win if the other side does not respond. Number 2. The value of victory is usually great enough, so that it would be worthwhile for either sides to raise its commitment enough to win the escalation if it were certain that the other side would not counter the rise. The term escalation covers Helperin's terms expansion and escalation, according to context, and our eruption is similar to his explosion. Number 3. Upper levels of escalation are both dangerous and painful, and each side wishes to avoid them. Therefore, the risks of escalation even to limited heights as well as to undetermined heights, and the risks of direct eruption to general war are all major deterring elements in almost all decisions about escalation or de-escalation, even when one expects to be able to prevail at the upper levels. Number 4. Typically, both sides are interested in systems bargaining, in preserving precedence, thresholds that reduce the likelihood of escalation, eruption, or other undesirable long-term effects. Number 5. There are two basic types of escalation strategies that each side can follow. A. Strategies based on factors relating to particular levels of escalation, agreed battle, or the specific situation. B. Strategies based upon manipulation of the risks of escalation or eruption. Number 6. Generally, each side will attempt to avoid looking like a cool mathematician or a cynical blackmailer in its tactics, and will emphasize the agonistic, stylistic, or familial aspects of its behavior. In this part, Kahn argues that every part in the conflict aims to provide an emotional sense to their logical actions. This is to avoid being considered out of the possibility of decreasing the conflict between all parts in the war. 
Finally, Khan acknowledges that in potential scenarios of escalation like the Ukraine-Russian war, it is clear why many people would like to conduct international relations the way a teenager plays chicken. They believe that if our decision makers can only give the appearance of being drunk, blind and without a steering wheel, they will win in negotiations with the Soviets on crucial issues. Finally, it is important to avoid a nuclear conflict at all costs. The use of nuclear weapons would be a humanitarian and environmental disaster and would have far-reaching consequences for global stability and security. It is in the interest of all countries to work towards a world where nuclear weapons are not used and where the risk of a nuclear conflict is minimized. This includes efforts to reduce tensions, promote dialogue and cooperation, and address conflicts peacefully through diplomatic means. This is why we hope this video can help you to understand the psychology and interests between the countries part of the conflict. That is it for today. I hope you liked this video. For more updates on this topic, like the video and subscribe to the channel. Remember, capitalism is about creating value, not money. See you all soon with more interesting information. Till then, see you.